Let me guess. Let me guess. All of us who are here on site and even online want to live a blessed life. Is there anyone who doesn't want to live a blessed life? No. I'm glad to hear that you are still, yeah, all right up here. <laughs> but question, what is a blessed life? How do you define or explain a life that is called blessed? I mean, what does it mean to live a life that you would say you are blessed or that you would see someone's life and you would say, boy, that person is blessed. He is blessed. She is blessed. That family over there, my neighbor, wow, they are truly blessed. What comes to your mind when you hear blessed life? Turn to your neighbor, whoever that is, right, left, or front, behind. Turn to one of your neighbors and share what comes to your mind when you hear blessed life. It can be a picture, it can be one word, it can be a phrase. Turn to your neighbor and just share what comes to your mind when you hear blessed life. Come on, just, just indulge me, right? And even those of you who are online... If you are alone, I don't know. Maybe you can <laughs> type uh, in the YouTube uh, chat, all right, chat box. For those of you who are watching online, come, just type. Or if you are watching with your family members, just share with one another what comes to your mind when you hear blessed life. Okay. Anyone? For those of you who think that your neighbor's answer is like, wow, superb. Can, I, can you raise your hand? Okay, one, two. Wow, there are a few of you. Wow, all right. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Sister Anita, you raise your hand, right? Come, tell us. What? All right, yes, indeed, why not? Family being happy together in unity, in harmony, that is a blessed life. Great. Erin? Her life is a wah. So, brothers and sisters, you want to know what the blessed life looks like? Look at Ming Chi. <laughs> but yes, of course, Ming Chi, don't, don't, don't be shy on that, all right? God called us. Hey, by the way, do you know, not really? And that's what we will learn today and for the rest of a few weeks down the time. Jesus invites us into a blessed life. Yes. So, Minchi, don't be shy. We are all, even you should have also a blessed life. If you're not, <laughs> you are also okay. <laughs> all right. Yes. Thank you. But, <clears throat> uh, brothers and sisters, by the way, anyone from the YouTube uh, chat box, anyone who is the e-asher today, is there anyone? No. Okay, all those of you who are watching online, very shy, huh? Well, you are even shy, more shy than out here. Okay, never mind. But did you know, uh, let me ask you, did you know that uh, Satan, S. Eitan, Mr. S. Eitan, anybody knows Mr. S. Eitan? Satan, <laughs> all right? Did you know that Satan has his own version of a blessed life? Y you didn't know that, all right? Let me show you. Uh, Satan's uh, version of a blessed life. Here, here it is. Let me show you. I call it Satan's Beatitudes, all right? Blessed are those who are too tired, too busy, too distracted to spend time with their fellow Christians in the life of the church, for they are my best workers. Blessed are those who wait to be asked and expect to be thanked, for I can use them in my business, Satan is saying, all right? Blessed are those who are touchy, very, like, too sensitive, all right? Soon they will stop going to church, for verily, 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 they shall be my missionaries. Blessed are those who sow gossip and trouble, for they are my beloved children. Blessed are those who have no time to pray, for they are my prey. I love this. It rhymes so well. 
Blessed are those who gossip, for they are my secret agents. Blessed are you, I love this part. Blessed are you when you read this and think that it has nothing to do with you. But it has everything to do with other people. For I've got a room for you at my inn. That's the Beatitudes of Satan or that's the version of a blessed life of Satan. Question, is anybody living your life according to Satan's Beatitudes in any way, at any time, for any reason? Anyone? Let me guess. If we are all honest, we may find ourselves living this kind of blessed life according to Satan's version in one way or another. At one time or another. For one reason or another. Amen to that? Not so encouraging to say amen to that, right? <laughs> I know. It's, but it's a hard reality. But here's the good news, my brothers and sisters, friends. Here's the good news. There's another kind of blessed life according to Jesus. And He invites every one of us. He invites every one of us to that kind of life. And here is the blessed life according to Jesus. And it's best known as the Beatitudes of Jesus. All right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read responsively. All right? So I will read the black one. You read, you respond with the red ones. All right? Here we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. What a blessed life, isn't it? Anybody? Isn't that a blessed life? But with, <laughs> yes, that's a great uh, amen. But I know if we are all honest again, I know what you are thinking. To the core of our being, being very real to ourselves, I know what we are thinking. I know what you guys are thinking because that's what I'm thinking as well. How can this be a blessed life? Of course, we don't dare to say that because it's the words of Jesus. But if we were to be honest of all these things, the Beatitudes of Jesus, we ask ourselves, how can this be a blessed life? How can such a hard and difficult life be called blessed what exactly is Jesus saying? I mean, it doesn't make sense, isn't it? Because it's totally upside down. It's hard. Question is, is this even possible? And the answer is absolutely yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Because the Beatitudes of Jesus is not about doing. It's not about you and I trying to do something, but it's about the reality of the being of someone who has become disciples or followers of Jesus. It's about the reality of when you become a Christian, you are invited and you are transported into that potential life, that blessed life. So it's about the being, the reality of the being of a disciple, of a follower of Jesus. Beatitudes of Jesus is not about you and I trying to do something. It's about the being. And therefore, the Beatitudes is the pathway to live our lives to the fullest. The Beatitudes is like a pathway to live our lives to the fullest potential 
as disciples or followers of Christ on this planet Earth. So this will be our new series for the next few weeks. Dio volante, God willing, beginning from next week, we will unpack one Beatitudes of Jesus each week, all right? And here's why we want to do this series. Threefold reason. To refresh our understanding of the blessed life of a disciple of Jesus. To examine ourselves to see how far we are living out this so-called blessed life. And finally, to repent and to realign. To repent and to realign to the blessed life that Jesus calls us to and live our lives to the fullest. As for today, I want to give you uh, the introduction by giving you the background or the context of this word blessed that Jesus mentions in his Beatitudes. And I believe and I hope that this will set the stage for the rest of our time together in this series in the following weeks. So with that, let me give you the first one. And that is this, the biblical context. The biblical context of blessed. Now, the Greek word for blessed simply means to be happy or blissful. Very simple. It simply means to be happy or blissful, but watch this. Not based on something that is external, but rather something that is of internal. In other words, this word blessed means inner joy. Now, William Barclay, a Scottish author, said this, and I really like the way he said, he said this, human happiness is something that is dependent on the chances and changes of life. So true, isn't it? Human happiness is something that is totally dependent on the chances and changes of life. Something which life may give and which life may also destroy or take away. But here is how he distinguished between the human general understanding of human happiness as opposed to what Jesus calls the blessed life. He says the Christian blessedness is completely untouchable or unsaleable. This blessed life or this blessedness can only be experienced through a growing personal relationship with Jesus. Remember when Jesus spoke these Beatitudes, he spoke to his disciples, but in the group, the large crowd involves other people who are just following because Jesus is a great teacher and he provides free food. But Jesus wants them to hear as well, just in the case that they want to decide to follow Jesus. And Jesus wants to be very clear up front that if you want to follow me, here is something you got to know. Apart from a growing personal relationship with Jesus, it cannot be experienced. So perhaps you may call yourself Christian all these years. But you may not be experiencing this so-called blessed life all these years because the sad reality can be this, that you have not been growing in your relationship with Jesus. Your Christianity is more like a religion. It's more like a ritual rather than a relationship that is growing, that is personal. And so to get it straight up, it's also a reflection for all of us. 
this blessed life that Jesus is introducing and inviting all of us to, you and I cannot be experienced, even if we call ourselves Christians, if we are not having a personal, growing relationship with Jesus, it cannot be experienced. Apart from that, it cannot be experienced. So, when we talk about being blessed, when we talk about being blessed in the Beatitudes for the next few weeks, we are not talking about the inner happiness or joy that is totally dependent on our circumstances, but on Christ. Is that clear? All right, so I think it's, it's, it's important we, we set the stage for what is coming because it's hard. It's really hard what is coming in the next eight weeks. So that is the biblical context within which Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, all right? An invitation to a blessed life to, for his followers, a pathway, you can call it, to live life to the fullest. Next is the world's context. <clears throat> the world's context. Think about Solomon in the Old Testament time, right? Solomon, everybody knows Solomon in the Old Testament time. He was the most magnificent king who ever lived on earth. No one can dispute that, I think. His palace was the paragon of the earth. His wealth was so immeasurable and his treasure was so vast that the Old Testament says that his silver was as common as rocks. <laughs> He was probably sitting and, uh, you know, playing with toys that are made of silver <laughs> or gold. That rich, this guy called Solomon. Solomon had buildings, servants, vineyards, fish ponds, gardens, you name it. And by the world's common world's standard, Solomon should have been an infinitely blessed, blissful, happy man on earth. But surprisingly, here is what he says, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. In other words, vanity, vanity, utterly, totally, vanity of all vanities, everything is meaningless. That is what Solomon said. What does this say to us? What does this say to us? Here's what I think is saying to us. Listen to this carefully. <clears throat> Physical or material things do not touch our souls. We cannot fill a spiritual need with a physical substance. You didn't hear that. Let me say that again. We cannot, let me put it to you. You cannot, let me put to myself. I cannot fill spiritual need with something that is of a substantial, or rather that is of a physical substance. So the good news is this. The Beatitudes of Jesus will show us how to live our life, to fill our spiritual need. The Beatitudes of Jesus is to show us the reality of those who decided to follow Jesus that has called to live into the reality of a life that where we can feel the spiritual need to the fullest. That's what Beatitudes is all about, and that's what it will show us. But here's the tough reality. Here's the tough reality. It's going to give us an entirely different standard of life. And to be honest, we may not like it. And for all of us, I mean, majority of you, except myself and, you know, <clears throat> Pastor Easing, all of you are out there in the marketplace. And the standard out there is different. And so, to be honest, at the core of your being, you will not like it. Because most of it are paradox. Most of it are upside, upside, upside down. It's totally the opposite value of the world out there that you are living in, that most of the time that you are spending. It's going to give us entirely different standards of life, totally opposite to what the world tells us. The question is, are you ready for it? That's the world's context within which Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, an invitation to a blessed life for his followers. 
The next is the political context, all right? The political context. Now, during the time of Jesus, the Jews, remember, if you read the New Testament, you should know this. During the time of Jesus, the Jews were looking for a Messiah, a Savior. In other words, a king, a king in the form of a political leader or ruler who will start a revolution against the Romans and freedom, free the Jews from the tyranny. That was what the Jews were looking for. And that is why they tried to make Jesus a king. That is why they tried to make Jesus their political ruler or king. But that's not what Jesus came for, right? And that's why many people were disappointed with Jesus. And that's why many people stopped following Jesus. Because they thought He was the Messiah. The promised Messiah who will be the king who will start the revolution against the Romans and free them from their tyranny and give them freedom. But Jesus is like the humble estate of carpenter's son. No, that is not right. And that's why many people were disappointed and stopped following Jesus. Jesus didn't come to change the political condition of our society, but the spiritual condition of individuals. That's what Jesus came for. You see, he was not after what the man would do. He was after what men are. You know why? Because here's the simple truth. Because what they are will determine what? What they do. What they are at the core of their being Internally, what men are will determine externally what they would do. And Jesus knew that very well. And that's why he came to change the spiritual condition of the individual's heart and not so much of the external, the political condition of our society. Now, that doesn't mean... Please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying, therefore, we don't need to think. We don't need to encourage our people to rise up to be in the political arena to, to settle some of the things that are not right. I'm not saying that. We need to do that. But what I'm telling you is that Jesus, he came not to change the political scenario. He came to change the spiritual scenario. So the Beatitudes of Jesus is about that. It's about the spiritual condition of individuals that has huge impact and that has huge implications on the political condition of our society today. So that's the political context within which Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, an invitation to a blessed life for his followers. Here's the final one. The religious context. And this is my favorite part. <laughs> Let me tell you why. During his time on earth, Jesus confronted the religious groups uh, for their focus and exaltation or even glorification on the external righteousness. Remember? And did you know that there were four main groups. There were four main groups within the religion of Judaism at that time. Do you know what they were? Well, let me show you. Here are the four groups. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. Now, the Pharisees, the Pharisees believe that blessedness or happiness was found in the tradition of the fathers or is found in legalism. That is to say, by obeying the tradition of the fathers. And that's why they were very serious about obeying 
the different laws that the forefathers came up with. They were very serious about maintaining and observing the traditions of the fathers rather than the scriptures, actually. Although the traditions were created so that in fulfilling the traditions, they will indirectly fulfill the commands of the scriptures, but something went wrong. And that is, they started to focus so much on the tradition at the expense of the scripture. Such that the traditions became the law of God. But Jesus came to tell them that religion is not external observance. The second group is the Sadducees. The, the Sadducees, they believe that happiness or blessedness is found in modernism or liberalism. Big word, but it simply means this. That truths need to be interpreted according to modern standards of life. Truths need to be interpreted according to modern times or modern standards of life. So in other words, what they are saying is this, truth will change according to time. What is true back then will not, may not be true at this time. What is true is determined by what and how of the times that we are living in. So in other words, truth is subjective, truth is relative. But Jesus came to tell them, religion is not human philosophy invented to accommodate the new age and new day. No, it's not a human philosophy. What about the Essenes? The Essenes would go further by saying this. No, 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 no. Happiness or blessedness is found in separation from the world. Or, to put it another way, by isolating yourself into the wilderness. And that's why this group of Essenes, they would discard the society and they would go up in the mountain, go up in the wilderness, and they would live by themselves. But Jesus came to tell them that religion is not geographical separation. No, it is not. And finally, the zealots. The zealots would say that, the, that blessedness or happiness was found in political revolution. That's right. And well, what they mean at that time, in the time of Jesus, is of course revolving or putting up against a revolution against the Roman rule so that they would be free from the tyranny. But Jesus came to tell them. Jesus came to tell the zealots, no, 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 no. Religion is also not social activism. There is a place for all these groups' emphasis. There is a place for that. But Jesus is saying, you are missing the point. You are putting the order wrong. So that was the religious context within which Jesus spoke the Beatitudes, an invitation to a blessed life for his followers. You can say a pathway to live life to the fullest. So, in all, we saw the four contexts of being blessed. The four contexts, the biblical context, the world's context, the political and the religious context. Question. Question. What is the common thread between the four of them? What do you think is the common thread between the four of them? Here's what I believe the common thread is, and that is this. The tension. The tension between the focus on the external versus the internal. The tension between the focus of the physical versus the spiritual. The external and the internal. The physical and the spiritual. And it was in the midst of such tension 
that Jesus spoke the Beatitudes. Jesus spoke what life supposed to be for his followers, for those who call themselves Jesus followers. If you don't call yourself Christian or Jesus followers, that is, Beatitudes of Jesus is not for you, but it's a good information for you. But it's more for those of us who have decided ourselves to call ourselves and to be his followers. And this is where it is in, in, in the midst of this tension Jesus spoke. And this is where I believe where the Beatitudes of Jesus is still relevant to us today. Don't you agree with me? Because, let's be honest, seriously, there is not so much of a difference between the time then and now. You don't have to look at the world. I mean, if you look out at the world, what's happening out there, you can tell quite obviously. But we are not here to tell or to say what the world thinks or what the world is going on. We are here for ourselves. We are here to examine our own life. And if you honestly examine your own life, you can tell the struggle. The struggle of the tension between the external and the internal, the physical and the spiritual. In fact, I would say that the tension is even more intensified today. And the intensity is that the external is taking over the internal. Still the same today. The intensity is that the physical need is taking over the spiritual need. I mean, look at the time we spend each single day. It, it can tell us. And how we spend our time and what we do with our lives, it can tell us which is taking over, the physical or the spiritual. I read and learned about goldfish. Anybody has goldfish as a pet at home? Don't be shy. No one. Uh, I... Uh... So from today onwards, after you hear about goldfish today, you can go and buy today, okay? Goldfish as a pet, okay? See? So nice. No one, really no one has ever you experienced having a pet before? As a, as a pet before? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Now confession time, okay? <clears throat> now goldfish. Um, I thought goldfish, you know, I thought goldfish, uh, they were just, you know, teeny tiny, cute uh, fish that were just meant uh, to be kept as a pet or as pets. But I learned that actually they could grow bigger than their size. They could grow quite big, actually. Right? Yeah, I, I, was, I was surprised. And of course... I mean, please pardon me, I, I, I have not so much, uh, I mean, I don't have not any knowledge on goldfish, I just read up a few, but of course, there are different species of goldfish, but, you know, they can relatively grow quite big, all right, uh, uh, as opposed to what you see here, like, ah, cute little fish, you know, they are meant to be just cute and then, you know, be a therapeutic for us, you know, when we are stressed, we look at the goldfish like, oh, thank you, Lord, for the goldfish, so tiny, teeny, tiny, you know, so cute. But in fact, they, were, uh, they, can, they, they, can, they can grow. That's what I learned. And I, and I was just fascinated. I read uh, that some goldfish, if you put in a bigger tank, you know, the, the fish will grow uh, to its uh, real size or the potentially original or big size that they are supposed to grow. You know, in other words... In other words, whether the fish experience its real potential size depends on where the fish lives. Let me say that again. Whether the fish experiences its real potential size depends on where the fish lives. If it lives in a small tank, it will never realize its real potential size. 
But if it lives in the river or an open sea, it will realize its real potential size. Likewise, brothers and sisters, friends, likewise, whether we experience the blessed life are you listening? Whether we, we experience the real blessed life of the Beatitudes of Jesus depends on where we live. Whether you experience the reality, the real blessed life of the Beatitudes that Jesus spoke about depends on where we live. If we live focusing on the external and the physical, we will never experience the real blessed life that God has prepared for us. We will never experience the blessed life that Jesus spoke in the Beatitudes. Never. If we live our lives focusing on the physical and the external. But if... We live focusing on the internal, on the spiritual, we will experience it. So let me ask you a personal question. Which one? Which one are you? Are you like the goldfish that never realizes its real potential size? Are you like this? And everybody look at you, wow, so cute. Oh, you are good enough. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, you know. You're a Christian. Oh, yeah, you're so, such a good person. Yeah, 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 you know. Or are you like the goldfish that realizes and experiences its real potential or its size? I don't know which one you are. Perhaps a more important question is this. Will you continue to be the goldfish to be like the goldfish that never realizes his real potential size. And the life it could live with. Will you? Will you or will you do something? Will you do something to be more like the goldfish that realizes and experiences its real potential size and lives life to the fullest. Of course, it doesn't look fullest. Lah. He's being caught. <laughs> but you know, right? You know, I'm just, I'm just making a point, all right? Because some of you, yeah, you may be making fun of me. Pastor, I don't want to be like this. Lah. I don't want to be caught. You know? I want to live in a small tank, you know. I'm not caught. I'm enjoying, you know. I'm being fed. But you know my point. The purpose of this sermon series on the Beatitudes is really to encourage all of us to become more like the goldfish that realizes and that experiences its real potential. It's not easy <laughs> for us but it's fulfilling. And I'm not suggesting that we move uh, to a, a bigger tank. It's like, okay, you know, maybe I will just broaden a bit of my perspective of life. No, it's not about moving from a smaller tank to a bigger tank. It's like, okay, let me just adjust some of my perspectives in life. No, it's not about that. Jesus is not telling you, I, I just need you to adjust a little bit of your perspective. Uh, it, too tiny, you know, jump over to a bigger tank. No, this is not the right picture. Let me show you the right picture. And I hope that you will remember this picture for the rest of, I wanted to say for the rest of your life, but... On a realistic point, you will forget. Lah, huh? We all forget, you know. After, uh, in the afternoon, you will forget what I preach. That's why, thank God, that uh, live stream, we have all the recordings, you know, so that you can go back and watch again and listen again and be reminded, all right? Uh, but here's the picture that I want to show you and I want to impress upon your heart and your mind. And I hope for the next eight weeks, it will stick in your mind. 
and say that this is what Jesus is inviting us to. And that is this. This is the picture. I want all of us to remember this is the right picture. If we want to realize and experience the real blessed life that God has prepared for us, then we will need to move out from the little tank that we are in to where God made us to be. And that is the vast ocean. That is the kingdom of God that He has invited all of us as disciples, as followers of Jesus. And Jesus made that point, and Jesus is still making that point even today in this beatitude, through the beatitude. Jesus is inviting us to be where He has put us to be in the vastness of the ocean. It's not just a bigger tank, but in the vast ocean, not in the limitation of the external or physical, but in the vast horizon of the internal, of the spiritual. Because that is where we will meet the life that God has given us to live. Life to the fullest. That is what the beatitude is all about. That is what Jesus is inviting you again. So I hope that you will prepare yourself for this ride for the next eight weeks. For this week, here's what I want you to do. Every day, before you go to work or before you start your work, Turn to Matthew chapter 5. That's where you will find the Beatitudes and read them at least once. If you want to read twice, that's fine. But at least once. And read it out loud. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You don't need to understand everything. Just read it so that your ears can hear, so that your heart can try to wrestle with it. Let it wrestle for the rest of this week and come back next week as we talk on the first beatitude. Can you do that? I'm going to test you, you know. Really. And it's not together, one by one. I was like, you run? Okay, first one. Dr. Matthew, the fifth one. Boy, must also remember which one is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth one. I'm not kidding, so please. Huh? So that's why every day you must read before you go to work, before you start your work. Please do that. And I hope that you will be, the Holy Spirit will just work in your life. All right. I don't know how He works, but He will work when we take His Word and feed our soul. Let me pray. So, Father, we thank you for setting the stage for the journey ahead of us as we relook, revisit the invitation that Jesus gave to his followers. I pray for all of us, including myself. Holy Spirit, please open our hearts and our minds. And lead us to where you are inviting us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's watch and listen to this song as a song of response to what we have heard.